Hey everyone, Pete from London Camera Exchange. You join us here today, just south of Winchester in a little woodland. Um, it's a little mountain biking trail jump track. Um, we'll explain a bit more about that in a second, but I'm joined here by Dave Parry, obviously the guru of everything, Canon. And uh, we've obviously known about a camera which has been sort of on the cards for a little while, little drip feeds of information and things. I've fortunately, you know, been lucky enough to see it face to face, but couldn't touch it. But now, there three is. months on. It's in your hands. I've got it. It's the <laughs> EOS R3. Now, I'm just going to let you start telling us about this because obviously we know some of the spec, but you're going to give us all of the spec now. So where do you want to start? Yeah, so, so obviously we've done the technology announcements on this. We've done a couple of announcements just to let people know what's coming and, and basically what we're up to. But now, yep, here it is, it's finally here. Now I'd like to tell you all the specification on this, but I don't think we've got time to go <laughs> through the whole lot. There are so many advances on this camera, even over the R5 and the R6, we've really moved forward with this. But first of all, I think what I'd like to do is kind of explain what this camera is about and who, we, who we've aimed yeah, this yeah, towards. Definitely. So, um, we spend at Canon. We spend a lot of time talking to um, high-end news, um, um, professional sports photographers, and they obviously love using our One Series products. Um, they've been using them for many, many years, and this kind of thing. Now, what we want to do with this is we really want to show those types of users what mirrorless can do for them, and create a product that gives them the best of the One Series and then the best of our R system. I mean, it, it is together. massively reminiscent of that One Series camera. I mean, it looks like you've kind of I don't know, stuck it in the microwave and it shrunk a little bit. <laughs> and this is what we're left with. And this is one of the cues for this camera. What we find with, um, at this kind of level, when people are used to using one series, they've been using the generations, you know, the Mark III, the Mark IV, the One DXs, and so on. <clears throat> they don't have to learn a new camera when they pick it up. And what you'll find with this, if you put this camera up to your face and start using it, your muscle memory on where the buttons are stays the same. So you can start using it straight away. It's even got the um, the optical yeah, I can uh, joystick see that. on the yeah, back. Yeah. So if you're used to using that, you've got that same uh, performance from here, which is which is just just fantastic to be able to pick it up and start using it straight away. And also, if you're used to using uh, a five an, an R5 or 5D for that matter, once again, this is the type of camera you could pick up and start using straight away. So it has those cues on it. I don't know if you've noticed, first time ever, we've got a variable angle screen on here. Oh. So one uh, uh, um, a high end camera, so a camera at sort of the one series level. Um, with a variable angle screen on there, which is um, which is uh, un unusual for us. We've never had a camera of this type with a variable angle screen on there. Um, and people worry about thinking, oh, what about the you know, what about the construction? What about the weatherproofing yeah, sort of and that kind of thing? Stuff, the ceiling. Yeah. We're saying this has the same level of ceiling as a one series product. Wow. Um, there are some differences between this and one series, which is why we can't call it one. Um, there's a couple of little things. One of the main things is about the durability of the body. So even though it's got the same sort of environmental protection, we call it, as a one series, um, if you're using, if you want a camera that's going to work in really extreme circumstances, like you're going to Antarctica, you're dealing in, you know, minus 20 degrees and all the rest of it, you might find a one series better because it has a, um, a different um, a, a button construction, which is designed to work in these really extreme circumstances. So um, uh, that's really why this is has come out of as a three and not as a one series product. From the last technology announcement, it stated that it was a Canon newly developed CMOS sensor. We obviously didn't have any megapixel count on there either. Um, so tell us a bit more about that. So it's 24.1 million pixels okay. and it's a stacked um, a back illuminated CMOS sensor. So it's the first time we've reused a sensor of this type in, in this type of camera. Um, and um, it's fantastic to have this technology. What the, um, the stacked sensor, because that means there's basically lots of circuitry behind the, the, the sensor to get the information off. And the beauty of that is, is you can do so much with um, at the speed of the information. So if you can get the information off the sensor really fast it opens up lots of new technology um, I wish I'd talk about a bit later on but um, megapixel wise yeah it's not necessarily the largest number of megapixels no any particular reason for that yeah so you look at things like the R5 has got 45 million pixels yeah. inside it and the 5DS and 5DS are with 50 million so we can produce sensors with much bigger me megapixel count it's about the type of user for this camera right so, once, as I mentioned earlier on, we're aiming this at the high-end sort of sports, um, news gathering and this kind of thing. And what these guys don't need so much is the big file sizes. So they want slightly smaller file sizes yeah. um, because they work in very fast environments. They want to get this, this footage off. They want to get this information or these, these files off to the 
publishing houses and so on. So they don't need the massive file sizes. Also, what you find with this sort of megapixel count is you find there's a really good balance between detail and low light capability. Right, yeah. As the megapixels go up, you lose that low yeah, light lose capability. Low light, yeah. um, and the third thing that is, um, uh, is really important for this is also the way movement looks and the way motion looks. If you've got a high megapixel count, you get things called pixel blur, and you get a different look to how motion looks, how the wheels look like they're spinning on a car or um, fabrics moving. And sometimes you have to adjust your shutter speeds, mm. and therefore it changes the way you shoot. So having 24 seems to be that good balance between okay. all these things and giving you the, the right image quality that people want at this level. Being designed and tailored for sports and action photography, you know, what else can that sensor do and perform? Well, I think one of the big probably headline specs is that it'll do 30 frames per second. That's pretty um, impressive. That's pretty impressive. That's with an electronic shutter. Yeah. And you can do that totally silently, or you can actually have a shutter sound. We have actually put an ability to put a shutter sound. Is it a nice shutter sound? It does it? sound nice, oh, yeah, okay, it good. does sound nice, yeah. <laughs> so um, so that's, so 30 frames per second is, is really the big, the big spec. Once again, it comes back to the sensor, being able to get that information off. Um, what you can do with this as well, is we've got um, the fastest shutter speed we've ever had, oh, wow. which is 64 thousandth of a second. Never thought I'd be saying that. <laughs> um, and you can imagine for like, you know, come back to like the champagne shots, yeah, the yeah. motor racing circuit or something. That sort of shutter speed would be absolutely fantastic. Um, something else the sensor's enabled us to do is it's enabled us to uh, really reduce the um, sort of rolling shutter distortion as well, which will make a massive difference for people shooting um, at this kind of level. Being at this Trials Park, um, that's why we've got a couple of random uh, bikers going behind us here. It's also why Dave is dressed in this rather vibrant colour uh, outfit, slightly different from what we're used to seeing him in. Um, we were told when we could see the R3 um, earlier this week that we would only be able to see it, not able to shoot on it. Um, and then you managed to get this beta sample for Absolutely, us. Absolutely, yeah. So you upgraded it. We can shoot with it, so we'll show you some sample footage a bit later on. But Dave has come to our uh, sort of rescue here, and he's going to be sort of hitting up the uh, the trails and uh, <laughs> the like jumps. <laughs> nothing too big, nothing too spectacular. We can't break him. TPS is soon. Um, we've got strict instructions from uh, the big bosses at Canon not to uh, cause any injuries. <laughs> You mentioned about the articulating screen being the first of its kind on a camera of this type. This is a big looking viewfinder on the back here. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that. So it's a 5.76 million dot viewfinder, 120 frames per second. Oh, something to mention about that as well. That coupled with this sensor, um, it's, um, it's a now blackout free. Oh wow. Um, so the only time you'll get blackout is if the buffer fills up. Um, so even at um, that 30 frames per second? Yeah, it's, wow. um, it's blackout free. Now, Something's interesting about this viewfinder is, and we did mention it in some of the technology announcements, um, is we have a eye detection system yeah, on here. Yeah, yeah. And we're not talking about eye detection as in when you're focusing, we're talking about it being able to detect your eye. Now, we obviously at Canon, we have a med, you know, big medical division, um, and they make machines that are designed to scan the eye and to map the eye. And they use um, uh, uh, LEDs, very low-powered infrared LEDs, okay? We now have the same system on here. So we kind of had a system similar to this about 30 years yeah, ago yeah, with the, yeah. um, the 5 and the um, 30 and the, um, what is it, the, um, I can't remember the other ones now, the 3, funny enough, um, and the 50E. I think there's another one, but I can't remember. Someone put it in the comments, I guess, if they remember <laughs> which ones they are. Um, now, so it's using a similar kind of system. So you've got LEDs inside here, which put a, a low-powered infrared beam onto your eye and can map your eye and can look at the movement of your eye. And what this will do, this will move an AF point around inside the viewfinder. Now what this is for, what I would use this for, is for that initial acquisition of your subject. So you can imagine you've got two guys on motorcycles coming towards you, you want to photograph the motorcyclist on the left. If you look at that motorcyclist, the AF point will go direct to that motorcyclist. Then when you've acquired it, if you press the shutter halfway or however you activate your AF system, it will then track that subject. So it's going to be really useful for uh, like motorsport wise when you're sat you know, on that corner and they're just about to come round. And you've got if four you're or five bikes at coming round. corner, it's going to pick up straight away what you're looking at, which is obviously going to be the vehicle, the motorcycle. Yep. yep, and whichever one you want. Instead of using one of the joysticks or something to move the AF point onto yeah, the bike yeah. you want, if you look at that, it'll pick that up. That's pretty impressive. Um, another reason I think this would be really useful as well is you can imagine for um, news gathering, if you've got six people stood in a line in front of you and the person you're interested in is second from the left, if you look at that person second from the left, 
the AF point will go to that person. Wow. And then when you activate the AF system, then whatever you set on the camera for its AF will activate and then track the subject or whatever, whatever you want it to do. That's going to be quite the fun key to, to that. <laughs> yeah, the key to it is going to be um, calibration. It's yeah. making sure you calibrate it correctly. Okay. Um, we recommend calibrating it a number of times and then calibrating it in the situation you're shooting in because ambient light does affect it. So once it's set up, it should be an amazing system to use. Well, so the eye detect is going to be really useful for motorsport, but something that came up in that last technology announcement was the vehicle tracking. Now, vehicles come in all shapes and sizes, obviously, <laughs> yeah. you know, and also sort of bikes and things, motorsport bikes. Does it work with push and pedal bikes? And that's the kind of thing I want to kind of look at today a bit, which yeah. is hence we're here. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this, so this vehicle tracking. So we've got um, uh, animal and we've got people. Right. Um, we've got eye detect, and now, yeah, as you mentioned, we've got vehicle tracking as well. So the idea of this is the um, the system is very similar to what we have on like the One DX with the deep learning capabilities. Yeah, yeah. So we've kind of trained and taught this system to recognize vehicles. Okay. Now the kind of vehicles it's um, designed to recognize is it's designed to recognize like saloon car shapes, so like right. rally cars and this kind of thing. Um, it's also designed to recognize helmets as well, like full face oh, wow. helmets. Um, so um, if you've got a Formula One car with a you know, person with a helmet obviously in, inside it, it'll recognize the car, then recognize the helmet as well. So it's designed to recognize like Formula cars as well. So it's that sort of genre of vehicles. Um, it'll recognize motorcycles as well, and it'll recognize the full face helmet. How it works on push bikes, this is what we're going to have a play around with today and have a test because we don't know yet how well it's going to work with push bikes. It'll work with motocross bikes, but it'll be interesting to see how it works with, works with push bikes. Um, what you can do is you can prioritise between the helmet or the vehicle as well. So if you're safe and doing motorcycles and you want to make sure the person is pinned sharp, you can prioritise that helmet over the vehicle. So you can change that depending on how you want to work. Yeah. We've also upgraded all of the AF algorithms. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is the fastest R camera for autofocus we've ever produced, so faster than the R5. So every time I meet with you and we look at new cameras, the ongoing joke from years ago was, does the camera have 4K <laughs> video capability? Um, well, I'm sorry to say it doesn't have 4K. <laughs> it has 6K. 6K, okay, <laughs> that's even better. Um, you can have 4K if you want. We do the, um, the, the HD, HDR PQ settings, so you have the ability to shoot at 6K and downscale to um, 4K if you want to, which does give amazing image quality. It's kind of similar to what we do on the R5, but obviously the R5 is 8K. Um, talking of the R5, like, I'd say most of the video functionality on this is of the same level as the, the R5. Right. So most of the things they can do, can do the lower bit rates mm -hmm. and this kind of thing as well. You don't lose the autofocus performance when you're shooting video. You have all of this capability on here. It will do 4K at 120 as well. Um, and the image quality at the 4K at 120 is better than the R5. So R5 wise with the 8K recording, obviously, it's probably not going to be your go-to camera if all you want to do is shoot video. Mm. It's kind of, it can do it if yeah. you're out and about and you want to it's shoot a hybrid a sort of, yeah. 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 Is it the same situation with this with the 6K or could you use this as a you know, a, a decent video setup. Really, the, the limitations is on the size of the body with the R5 and being able to dissipate that heat, as we all yeah. know. Um, with this camera, you've got a larger body. The components are further apart, and there's a very big magnesium alloy shell inside here, and therefore heat can be dissipated a lot easier. Right. So this one will run longer than the R5 will. Um, you will have that ability to be able to shoot for longer periods. So potentially, this one could be used for, for more video work than other products that we have in our lineup. If you are doing dedicated video though, I'd still recommend looking at things like yeah. the C70 or Cinema EOS range. But if you want to do more video as well as stills, this could be well worth looking at. In this day and age, you know, the speed of the camera and how it can perform is massively important, but also how quick these guys who are using the, the kit in the field can get those images off to news agencies or uploaded onto the social media platforms. Wi-Fi's obviously been there for a while. There's a LAN port here as well. So obviously there's some decent connectivity in this camera. What can you tell me more about? So this is actually the most connected camera um, we've ever made. So right. there isn't an external Wi-Fi transmitter for this. Okay. So if you want that, it's got to be the One Series or the R5. Um, but this has a lot of connectivity inside it. So it has um, five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Right. It has um, Bluetooth. It also has the LAN connection on there as well. 
So you can use this with our Canon Connect app, um, which allows you to control the camera remotely, um, and also with the MFT app as well, which is a fantastic free app that we do, which gives you the ability to send images from the camera to your smart device and then off to an FTP server as well. Um, this also has GPS inside it, uh, which is really, really useful at this for, you know, for these sorts of people that can be using yeah. this. And it works with the three different um, satellite systems oh, cool. as well, which actually most of our cameras do, but we don't really talk about it very often. But yeah, this has a, you know, has that, has that full GPS capability as well. Like you said, the, the button layout and the sort of handling of the camera all looks really familiar. Um, under here, there is a hot shoe I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, there is. So you can take the rubber seal, seal on off. top. That is well sealed on there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, so that is a, so it's, it's a standard size hot shoe. Yep. Um, in that any of your accessories that you use with a normal hot shoe will work on here. There is a difference with this one. And underneath that metal plate at the front, you can see there, yeah, there's, there's 21 complex. pins. Okay. And that is about a two-way communication between the, um, the accessory that you can have on the top and the camera itself. This is really exciting um, because not only can you have that communication, you can also power the accessory using the camera. So I don't know if you've, uh, I use microphones every now and again, yeah, sometimes yeah. I pick it up and it's got a little CR2023 or something inside right. it. Yeah, yeah. And you never know how much power is in that battery. Um, but if you've got it taking power from the camera, you don't have to worry about things yeah, like yeah. that. And the beauty of that also is means we can make smaller, lighter accessories because you haven't got to worry about powering them themselves. We can also make smaller accessories because you can use the camera to use the accessory to activate the accessory. So you can use the menu on the back of the camera to work that accessory as well. So that is really exciting. We have got some accessories coming which will work with this and looking forward to the future and seeing what the capabilities are of that. So jumping back to that new sensor that you've developed, how does it perform in low light situations? So that's one of the reasons to go for um, 24 million is, is because of that low light capability we spoke about before. Um, this does give the ability to shoot on ISO up to 204,800, right. which is a, you know, a huge, huge figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, funny enough, people who are shooting in the news gathering situation, which is kind of what we're aiming this towards, are more likely to use these higher ISOs than other people because they've got to get that shot yeah, and they'll, yeah. you know, they'll accept a little bit of noise or maybe a slight drop in image quality to get that shot. So these guys, it's really important. And what I, what's great about that, if you are shooting in these super low light conditions, this is actually the most, um, uh, uh, most impressive, I suppose, AF system in low light. Right. Because it'll do minus 7.5 EV. Wow. Uh, which is the lowest light AF we've ever created. I'm still trying to think of what set minus 7.5 looks like, because that's beyond Darkness. No moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it just shows you how good this um, system is in low light. If you are shooting in dark conditions, it does have in-body IS right. as well. The system will perform in the same way as the R5 and the R6, although it might be slightly different on some of the components, but the, um, because of the difference in the body, um, uh, the actual performance will be the same as what you'd expect from those products. So we're going to stick you on your bike now. <laughs> we're going to join these guys who are just passing behind and you know, put this through its paces, see what it can do stills-wise for us, a bit of video. Um, hopefully we won't break you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Brilliant.
Dave, thanks so much for today. Um, we didn't break you. This is the evidence. <laughs> oh, okay. You're still in one piece. So from here to TPS, if anything happens, it's not on us. Um, it, the R3 is pretty phenomenal. It's great to finally get hands-on with a working model. Um, obviously, it's a beta version, so whether the, you know the full production version is going to be even better and more responsive, I don't know. But from playing with it for that short time, I've, I've really enjoyed myself, and it's been a really good experience. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me down. No, no problem, problem at all. all. Um, if you'd like any more information at all on the EOS R3, obviously check out the link below or pop into your local London Camera Exchange.